We've had some pretty good guests tonight, but I gotta tell you, we've, I think we saved the best for last. My coworker, my good friend, you know him, Paul LaDuca. Thank you very much, I appreciate that. How are you, Paul? It's good to have you, thanks for coming. Thanks, I appreciate it. I, 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 my, when I used to come to the plate, my coming out song was Staying Alive, and so now that we're doing smoke for jockeys, I'm a little upset I didn't get smoke to come out to. <laughs> I like that. I know. Yeah. What do you think about? Were you there for the meeting on my idea for the smoke? I want to have the crew come out for the smoke thing. Yeah, th that's a, actually pretty funny. The unsung heroes come out they, there. They the are. Smoke. I mean, yeah. Ernie Munich, who yes. tapes our show, uh, Ernie's who does the best. So much for us at Naira. Yeah. Give Ernie a big hand. Everybody knows Ernie. He's here every week. He's the best. He really does. And I and I and I, I, I think that. I hope that people appreciate as much as we do how much the guys behind the scenes do because they do so much more work than we do. No, they really do. Uh, I always equate it to when I played baseball, they're the coaches. They're always there like two hours earlier than us and two hours later. And what Ernie does on the side, John Ambriel, is John, uh, Johnny Eyeballs as we call him, and John Ambriel, and, and, and the rest of the guys in the truck just do a phenomenal job. They actually make us look better. No, no, no question about it. We yeah. can use all the help we can get. <laughs> all of us. Are you uh, excited for tomorrow? Big day? I, I'm very excited. Listen, it, it, it's Traverse Day here at Saratoga. It doesn't get any better than this. You got a wide open field. Um, and you got some superstars tomorrow that are going to be on display, obviously, and two of the best trainers that we just saw with uh, Carlos and, and Bill Mott. So I'm excited for it as in any other Traverse Day. D when's the first time? What's your first Traverse? Do you remember? Wow. Been a minute. I'm getting old, Andy. To join the club. Uh, wow. Mine was 75, Wajima. I got to say, it's probably like in the 80s. I I'm 47 now, so... Um, um, He's young. Yeah, I'm a baby, right? Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> uh, I thank you. I wish that. I wish I was 37. I'd still be playing baseball for the Mets. Yeah, that's right. How old were you when you broke in the, when you actually officially... Well, I mean, playing, you were, we were talking about this. You had some years where you played, you went back and forth, yeah. the minors. Um, well, I, I didn't make it fully to the big leagues until I was 25, but I was up and down uh, till full-time 27. And sometimes I always, I, 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 I asked myself, would I have been able to play in the big leagues at age 21 and been able to handle it? And now that you know no. me, no, uh, <laughs> I, I just wasn't. I was an animal. I'll be honest with you. I was a kid that liked to have a little fun off the field. But when I played on the field, I took it very serious and um, somewhat too serious. And <laughs> I needed to control that a little bit and, um, and mature. So those 10 years I spent in the minor leagues, it taught me a lesson. And I became a better catcher because they moved me from second base to third base, and then Mike Sosha made me a catcher, and then that's what made my career. Really? Yeah. How did that, how did that happen? Oh, well, I got called into the office in 1996, and he basically said, hey, uh, the brass wants to release you, or you got to become a catcher. I'm like, well, there's no options there. Uh, <laughs> uh, you had to send me a glove. And it, it just shows you how ruthless it is, because two years later, I had led the Cal League in hitting. But you end up realizing that there's a lot of guys that can hit. But there's a lot of guys that can't catch it. So um, I had to realize that defense came first. And sort of I gave up hitting a little bit for a little while to, to learn that defense was more important, more important, learning the pitching staff, learning um, the hitters. And I think that's why I became a horse handicapper, to be honest with you. So figuring out the puzzle and all that kind of stuff, I was good at. So he saw that in me. I was an awful catcher when I first started, and he made me a good one. Now... In, in doing that, did you often, did you ever find yourself fighting with some of the pitchers you worked with, seeing things you want to do one way and they obviously want to do another way? Yeah, constantly. Really? It, uh, you fighting? I can't believe yeah, it. Yeah, right? It's a shock. It, to be honest with you, when you're catching in the big leagues, you're basically a catcher and you're a psychologist at one point because there's, like, there's certain guys you need to... You need to fire up a little bit and give him confidence. And then there's other guys you just need to stay away from. A guy like Kevin Brown, I remember the first time I ever caught him, I was a rookie in the big leagues, and I walked out to the mound, and we were confused on the signs. And here I am, this young kid, like second day in the big leagues, Kevin Brown signed for 100 and something million, and he said, you know exactly what the hell, hell, using the right word, are you doing out here? Go back there and put down the signs. I said, okay, Mr. Brown, I'll be right back. <laughs> so there's certain times where you just got to keep your mouth shut and you know when the play ends. Right. I mean, what, at what point do you get to the point where you would feel comfortable saying, 
I need a little help here. We yeah, need exactly. To figure it you know, out. when you get a little older and you get more established, and when I got more established and I was with the Mets, I had already had seven, eight years. Now I could have a mind to tell a guy, hey, listen to me. There was guys like Tom Glavin. There was guys like Orlando Her Hernandez, El Duque. There was guys like Pedro Martinez that I caught that, listen, uh, those kind of guys, you listen to them. Um, but when I caught John Main, Oliver Perez, and some Philip Hughes and some of those other guys, no disrespect, you listen to me. <laughs> what was it like catching Pedro? Oh, uh, well, I caught Pedro at the back end of his career, but there was a couple times the brilliance that he had was insane for the size because a lot of people don't realize when they draft pitchers, they draft pitchers of their height because they want more tilt on the ball because the flatter the ball is, the easier it is to hit. Now, here's a guy that was five foot nine in the steroid error that had under a two ERA, but he had insane stuff. He was, hmm, cocky, confident, but he was so darn good, Andy. He was unbelievable. He could throw any pitch at any time he wanted, but he had crazy fingers. He could actually take these two fingers and touch the back of his hand. They were almost like slingshots. Really? So it's crazy. So he had the ball almost for so long, and I remember when I faced him, I'm like, why, why is he so hard to hit? And I remember I was like, oh, holy cow, the ball gets on you in a hurry. So it was one of those things where he hit it very well, and he sort of slingshotted the ball. You, so you, were, you and I were talking recently about Roger Clemens. You had a, a very few, <laughs> but you hit a home run off him, right? Yeah, my only grand slam I ever hit was off Roger Clemens, yeah. Is that right? And it, 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 <laughs> That's worth a cheer. It was a crazy coincidence. Uh, I, I was actually with Sean Green. Sean Green and, and Roger Clemens played together in Toronto. And he had told me that Roger carried his glove in a suitcase. And I'm like, wait, wait, wait a second. You're kidding me, right? He's like, no, I'm dead serious. This guy carries it in a suitcase. I'm like, you got to be out of your mind. So I'm like, he's like you want to meet him? I'm like, of course. Now, I had totally forgotten, like, lost train of thought. We had a day game. I'm facing him. So we go to the hotel. They were staying, he was, the Astros were staying at the Beverly Hills Hotel at the time. He was pitching for the Astros. That was when Pettit and the boys were there. Um, and they were very good. Um, and he big leagued me more than anything in the world. He wouldn't even say hi to me. He was nice to Sean, da da da. And I was, hey, Roger, what's going on? Because I was trying to get an autograph from my brother, who was a big Roger Clemens fan. And he did not want any part. Well, there's a certain thing in baseball where pitchers don't really like to talk to hitters, other hitters. Because if you end up talking to them and you own them, then you talk to them, they sort of think it's a jinx a little bit. So Roger didn't want to talk to me. Well, I hit a grand slam that day off him, and I... Yeah. What's the jinx then? No, I, 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 I showed him up a little bit, so Paul, he deserved it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say we're out of time, but I, I had such a good time. Thanks for coming. I love it. Thank you, Andy. Thanks so much. My man, Paul LaDuca.